all please do me a favor as we start. Take a moment to reflect on a really important person in your business or professional career. Now, we'll all immediately think of the people we work with every day, the kind of bedrock of our network. But think a little bit further. Think about the people who've given you the really big opportunities, the really big breaks. Now, everyone in this room is going to have a different story. But I'd wager that for most of you, there will be a common thread running through these connections. The person you think of will be very different from yourself, whether it's an investor, a corporate decision maker, a journalist, a partner company. It's not the kind of individual you hang out with every day. Now, your key person that you brought to mind might not be quite so dramatically different from yourself, quite so asymmetric a connection as this suggests. But we've all experienced or observed the value in business of two very different people coming together. The outsider meets the insider. The person with the great idea meets the person with the resources or capital to develop it. The creative genius meets the business genius, and so on. The problem, though, with these high-impact, asymmetric connections that, in retrospect, we all appreciate and value so much is that they're so difficult to create. And also, in a world where we often have a numbers approach to networks, it's easy to forget how important they are. And in fact, what online business networks often encourage us to do is meet more people who are like us they tell us about the people who have profiles like us. They tell us about groups with people in, it, in them who are like us. So we end up often seeing more and more people around us who resemble ourselves. At the same time, these networks make it easy to measure your number of connections, but not the number of connections that are likely to lead to something really important in your career. So we tend to make lots of the easy, low-potential connections and very few of the high-potential, asymmetric connections. And then we tell ourselves we have a good network. I'm fascinated by this problem, the problem of how we create more asymmetric connections more frequently, because the payoff of doing this is enormous. Now, take a moment to think about the emotion you felt when you met the person you recalled earlier. The chances are it was one of two. The first, the less likely one, is this. It was unexpected. There was sheer serendipity in the meeting. You sat down on a long-haul flight, and instead of the proverbial snorer, you sat next to a business executive who because they were going on holiday, happened to be an economy, and they happened to have a connection to a company you'd always wanted to work with, and so on. This doesn't happen that often. More often, when you make a great asymmetric connection, you feel like this, like a total fish out of water. Because if you actively pursue these connections, you have to do two things. First, you have to take yourself out of your comfort zone of people like you. And this is really scary for our egos. Second, you have to break through the very significant barriers that surround people with lots of resources and power and little time. And this is just plain difficult to do. So what happens is that we end up just not making them, because you never know when you connect to someone like this if you'll have the door slammed in your face or if you'll cut the deal of your lifetime. Now, I've had a lot of experience with the first, with having the door slammed in my face, having grown up, as was touched on earlier, in a way that pretty much 
guaranteed I'd be an outsider, that I'd be asymmetric to everyone I encountered. So when I was six, my family moved back to Botswana, where my father set up a flying doctor practice. My mother homeschooled us, in theory. In practice, what she did was most of the time let us run pretty wild in the bushveld. We lived in the middle of nowhere, opposite a single house, my grandfather's house, my grandfather's pictured here, in a lonely stretch of Botswana bush. Now, my grandfather made my parents look pretty conventional. And if you think that's just nostalgic hyperbole, this is, this is his bedroom. Now, the amazing thing about this photo is you can't see the most astonishing feature of this room, which is hanging above this bed. This is his bed. It's an old aeroplane wing. This is another of his aeroplanes, which didn't fare quite so far, didn't get the tender, loving care from my grandfather that the first one did. Now, the big upside of this upbringing was that it kind of forced us to be entrepreneurs. When I was 10 and I wanted a new saddle, my parents said, well, start a business so you can earn some money to buy one. So I did. I started selling free-range eggs to the local community, a business which later gave the title to the memoir I wrote, 20 Chickens for a Saddle, the story of this incredibly outside family. Um, in fact, when we moved to the uh, Tule block later on, we were usually referred to as snark cementsa, or strange people. It gave me a story. It also gave me a passion to create a business that tackled asymmetric connections, that made it easier for outsiders to get on the inside. The book gave me capital for this business. It also gave me a business partner. I met at Cambridge a former diplomat um, who, being a New Zealander, um, had also experienced, like many of you would have experienced if you've set up in London or tried to work in, in a place like London or, or New York, how extraordinarily difficult it is to get in from the outside. So I started the business with him, Hamish, and my brother Damien, a fellow Botswana outsider. Basically, what we do, <clears throat> and we founded this on the premise that you should get through, not because of who you know or where you're from, but because you're serious and committed to your ideas. So we put the value back into online contact by putting a price on people's heads. It's kind of counterintuitive, but think about it. The problems with connections online is they're so cold. The internet should have democratized access to opportunities. Everyone's connected, so the people with the best ideas, the most deserving people, should get through. But that's not yet the reality of what happens, because we're too connected, and all connections online are kind of created equal. So busy people just overlook stuff, because it's impossible to properly consider the stream of information from the outside. So you've got a paradox where old boys' networks have kind of become new boys' networks, and it can be just as difficult to get through to a busy person, and you can't blame them, because if we processed everything we saw, we'd have no hours left in the day. And this serves neither side. People with resources who want to hear from the best, fresh ideas from beyond their networks overlook them. But if you make people pay money, you do something very powerful. You as a sender, if you want to contact someone on One Leap, and we have a database of corporate decision makers, investors, social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, Georgia is a senior decision maker at MTV, you have to put up money to contact them. So you value that message more. You select much more carefully who you contact. And the thing is, they value that message more, too, because they know something about the person who's contacting them already, before they've even read that message. They know that you are someone who's willing to put
put your money where your mouth is because you're serious about contacting them. It repersonalizes online contact, which has become often so unpersonal. The twist is you can't pay for access. That's inherently unfair. So we use the money differently. When that person responds to your message and you get a guaranteed reply on one leap or your money back, that money, or 80% of it, less a commission, goes to a charity that they choose. So it completely changes the dynamic of a connection online. The person contacting is getting through on terms set by the recipient. People have different prices. They range from $5 to $50 to $100. But in most cases, they're modest fees. They're the cost of, of lunches or coffees. People know you're serious. They value the connection more. They know the money is going to charity. That's the worst case. And they've set all the terms. People on One Leap never receive more messages a month than they choose. They cap that. So the whole quality of all the connections has increased. And if you contact anyone on this database, we've got Taddy Bletcher, who some of you may know, an amazing South African social entrepreneur. Doug Richard is an investor and former dragon from Dragon's Den in the UK. Michael Acton Smith has founded a huge company uh, in the UK. If you contact any of them, however asymmetric they are to you, you know you're getting through on their terms. You know you're getting through with a warm connection. Now, some of the asymmetric connections we've created. Ashika, a social entrepreneur from the US, invented a stiletto shoe with a retractable heel that you can convert to flats. Her business model is really interesting. She wants to generate money with the sale of the shoe to help the fight against trafficking. That requires a bit of imagination, not your traditional investor, your traditional partner. She used one leap to get through to senior people at MTV and Virgin. Then we have Joel, who's based in Nairobi, who's created Mobius Motors, which is building these wonderful, cool, cheap cars for Africa. He's used one leap to get through to investors in the UK, to a journalist in Africa. He's got a board member out of it already. Then we have Ollie, who's raising money for sponsorship to sail, sorry, sorry, to row around the South Pole. He got through to senior corporate people to talk about sponsorship. These are difficult connections to make normally. They require the person getting that message to pause long enough to think about it, to have a bit of imagination. And that money in One Leap makes people pause. Now, we've had a few big surprises creating this company. And I want to just mention two really memorable ones. The first is how willing senior people have been to participate, to sign up. Very busy people nonetheless know that the great ideas and opportunities, the next big thing, aren't going to come to them through their existing networks. They're going to be from people in places and sectors they don't know. The other, and this graph kind of speaks to that. In the past, innovation came from the inside. Now innovation is outside in. And companies know they can't recreate that inside. They know the best they can do is to co-create it, to work with fresh minds and talented people with great ideas, like many of you in this room. So their willingness to be open is quite remarkable. On the other side, We've had this amazing reaction from people who want to make contact. So we have, just to kind of recap, created OneLeap, which is a platform that allows anyone to get through if they're willing to put their money where their mouth is, pay a fee to charity to show they're serious, to which people have signed up in order to hear from people beyond their networks. And we get people writing to us and saying, so I found this person on OneLeap who I really want to contact. Do you think it would be OK if I sent them a message? And we sit there bewildered, thinking, what do we have to do to persuade people that it is OK, that these people want to hear from them? But it shows how deeply ingrained in us 
is this reticence about reaching out to people where we're not quite sure how it's going to go. Now, I'd like to just conclude by thinking about asymmetrical connections in South Africa, which in many ways is the ultimate asymmetrical society, which also means to me that there's a massive opportunity to create a lot of value by bridging these divides between people. Now, this is an extreme example. This photo is taken a few hours' drive north of here in Brunfle Maximum Security Prison, just near Worcester. This is the subject of my second book, taking writing about outsiders to an even greater extreme. It's the story of a group of maximum security prisoners who 10 years ago began an AIDS orphan adoption program, supporting kids in the local townships who had absolutely nothing. And through this astonishing program, they have created relationships and connections and value. They've started an enterprise within the prison that spread to other prisons, which has completely transformed their lives and the lives of hundreds of children and hundreds of people around them who thought it couldn't be done. That's a very social example, but think for a moment about being an entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur in South Africa, in the society where there are people from such different groups so often brought closely together, where things are changing so very fast. It offers tremendous potential to create new and su surprising value if you're innovative by employing people across different sectors and offering value to a company but offering new jobs and huge value to the person you're employing by investing in technologies developed in different groups, people from the outside, by partnering with big companies who more and more are getting in on the game of entrepreneurship, who more and more know in countries like these that they need both to serve very wealthy communities and very poor ones as well. And there's a funny thing about South Africa at this moment, I think. I mean, coincidentally, there's a parallel with my book. When it first came out, when I first started talking about it, or rather when I talked about Botswana, people, no one knew where, where I was from. Uh, they thought it was South Africa, maybe a province, maybe somewhere in the southern tip. And then Alexander McCall Smith wrote his famous number one ladies detective agency, which some of you may have re read. And now you say Botswana and everyone says number one ladies detective agency. Now the parallel in the tech world is kind of mobile. Two years ago, when I said in London that I was from Africa, um, people would say, would basically change the subject and t start talking about Silicon Valley. It's amazing the change. This is really Africa's moment in the technology scene. Now people say, oh, you know, to Chris's earlier talk, isn't it incredible what's happening in mobile? And do you know anyone in South Africa who can connect me to so-and-so and so-and-so? Suddenly, the world is looking here, and the original uh, outsiders are the new insiders. And I think for South Africans in particular, there's a tremendous opportunity to bridge the gap between huge resources from wealthy countries and a lot of the, the action happening north in the rest of the continent because people feel more secure about the entry into, into this country. So in the spirit of our platform, which forces people to send short messages and make them succinct, I'm going to wrap up here and I just encourage you to find more ways whenever you can, offline and online, to step out of your comfort zone and make connections with people who not like you, with people who are difficult to reach. Because they probably want to hear from you a lot more than you imagine. And I believe you're making the best possible investment, one that will pay off much more than you imagine possible and for so much longer than you imagine possible. Thank you.